Sure. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our joint webinar with ORUK this evening, which is on metastatic spinal cord compression. My name is Nikki Evans, and I'll be your host for this evening. We have the pleasure of Mr. Michael McEwen um, as our guest lecturer. lecturer. He's a consultant spinal surgeon at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital and has completed fellowships in Leeds covering the whole breadth of spinal surgery, as well as fellowships in paediatric and adult spinal deformity and spinal tumor surgery at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. Joining me this evening is Ruth and Hannah from the ORUK, and our mentors this evening are Joe and David. So our program this evening is as follows. We will have the lecture on metastatic spinal cord compression, followed by um, some MCQs, which we'd like you to complete as soon as possible, please, and we'll talk through them. We'll then um, ask the invited questions. So if you have a question during the lecture or afterwards, if you pop it in the chat, we will keep an eye on that and we will ask um, Mr. McGowan at the end. Um, we'll then go on to some cases and some top tips for the survivors. <clears throat> Um, and then we will move on to the Viva practice and stop the recording. If you miss any part of this lecture, don't worry about it. It will be on the FRCS Mentor website as well as the ORUK website. So you can watch it um, at your leisure. Um, I'd just like to mention that we have the upcoming Viva courses um, in conjunction with ORUK um, on the 20th of February, 6th of March and the 17th of April. Um, there are upcoming webinars on both the FRCS Mentor website, which is frcsmentor.co.uk, and the ORUK website, which is oruk.org. Um, finally, I'd just like to recommend our books, which are the two books at the bottom from ORUK, which I've used both for my exams, and they're excellent, and obviously the ones written by the FRCS mentors. So... Um, Ruth and Hannah will be sending you feedback forms and we'd be grateful if you could fill them in so that we can continue to improve. Um, and if you require a CPD certificate, then get in touch with Ruth and Hannah and we'll be able to help you out with that as well. So without any further delays, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Mr. Mokuan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Michael McCurm, um, consultant spinal surgeon at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital uh, in Stanmore, uh, London. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining and for inviting me to uh, to give this uh, talk uh, this evening. Um, so the talk is on metastatic spinal cord compression, which we know is is really very common. And uh, you may ask, well, why is this within your curriculum? We'll explore those, and, and we'll discuss exactly why it is in your curriculum. Um, so we'll, we'll look at why metastatic spinal cord compression has become very important within orthopedic and spinal surgery. We'll look at the background to that, discuss some of the NICE guidelines. We'll have a brief discussion on the MRI interpretation, which I know you'll probably be very familiar with because that's in preparation for your FRCS exam. That's one of the key topics. Um, We'll discuss some of the patient pathways of how these patients are managed, um, some of the evidence which led to where we are today with uh, spinal cord compression, and then we'll discuss the management strategies, what surgery offers. Uh, we'll look at some questions and run through a few cases. And uh, by the end of that, I'm sure uh, you will be bored of me. So why metastatic spinal cord compression? Well, because it is devastating to patients or potentially devastating. And getting it right makes a world of difference to the patients. And whether that's in terms of their, uh, you know, their, their, their prognosis, but also sometimes it makes a huge difference to the quality of life in the, to when, they, when they're nearing the end of life. There's a huge difference in someone who retains continence and retains the ability to, to walk or to transfer and, and, and the, the other scenario where the patient loses the ability to walk and loses their continence. So it fits into the spinal red flags. We always talk of spinal red flags and they're different lists depending on 
um, which literature you read, but you know, Mr. MSCC is a history of cancer often in these patients and the acute neurological deficit. And that can be sensory, motor, or bladder and bowel involvement. When we look at carcinomas that commonly spread to bone, and I'm sure this comes up in a lot of your preparation for the FRCS, but we know that breast, lung, thyroid, renal, and prostate are the five carcinomas that most commonly spread to bone. It is important to remember that virtually any tumor can spread to bone. And you know, especially the, uh, don't forget about um, the, the tumors such as lymphoma, plasma cytoma, um, myeloma, but any, any tumor can spread to bone. And about a third of patients who have breast carcinoma will end up with spinal uh, metastases. Only the liver and the lung are more common sites of metastases than the spine. The spine is the most common bone uh, where we'll find metastases and the thoracic spine is the most common region. So if we go back to around 2005 and before, metastatic spinal cord compression was not really on the horizon of, of orthopedic surgery and spinal surgery because these patients all received radiotherapy and steroids. And then there was some evidence to support surgery being involved and playing a, a major role in these patients. And we'll look at that evidence in a short while, but looking at the NICE guidelines, these NICE guidelines, is, it's uh, clinical guideline number 75, which was published now quite some time ago, 12 years ago, but not much has changed. And if we look at what these guidelines are about, well, they talk about metastatic spinal cord compression, which is the, the cord compression, but also cord requiner compression. This can be either due to direct compression by the tumor, a fracture, so a pathological fracture leading to neuro neurological injury of either the spinal cord or the cord requiner. And this threatens or causes neurological disability. We see approximately 4,000 cases each year, and I think that's probably about right. Um, at the RNOH, we, we get between five and 10 referrals a week, and not all of those are true MSCC. A lot of them will be, well, this patient's deteriorating, will you give us an opinion? But I think there are around 4,000 cases a year in the UK. Um, often they diagnosed late, and 50% of patients who diagnosed with MSCC are unable to walk at the time of diagnosis, and clearly this leaves them with a poor prognosis. If they are walking when they are diagnosed, about 80% will continue walking. So let's briefly just talk about MRI interpretation in the spine. Well, I'm sure you're very familiar with MRI scans by now. And so if you look at T2 images, so T2 is usually the image that we look at. And what we're really trying to identify is whether the spinal cord within the canal is at risk. And so here you can see that's a normal level. You see the spinal cord surrounded by the CSF, which shows up a lot brighter because this is a T2 image. And clearly there is no risk here to the spinal cord. This patient has a bit of degenerative change, but there is no acute risk to the spinal cord. And if you look at it in, in an axial view, you can see the spinal cord surrounded by the CSF and the nerve roots leaving into the foramen at each side. So that's a normal cervical spine MRI with some degenerative change. If you look at the lumbar spine, so remember the conus uh, will be around the L1-2 level and that's just behind L2 here. So again, the spinal cord itself is not threatened in any way. There's a good volume of CSF. There is some degenerative change and there is one level which has severe stenosis. And you can see the stenosis there with the spinal cord or the cord requiner being significantly compressed. Um, but this is a degenerative uh, condition. So just to highlight the fact that we need to understand what a normal MRI will look like before we see what the uh, pathological MRIs will look like. And, and that we'll see in our case discussion toward the end of uh, the evening. Of note, metastatic spinal cord compression is managed along a patient pathway. 
Now, these patients are managed in a multidisciplinary setting. So that's usually the oncologists as well as the spinal surgeons, and they're managed within a network. And that's very important. Every region has a spinal surgery network, and there should be rapid access for patients into that spinal surgery network. And there's usually very good communication between the oncology service and the spinal surgery service. And this is from the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital's website. You don't need to know this patient flow. It's just to give it you an idea of, of the network as, aspect and, and the patient pathways that we try to aim for. So if you're going into the FRCS exam, metastatic spinal cord compression should be a bread and butter uh, question for you, but you want to make it your home run question. You have to know Roy, something about the Roy, Roy Patchell paper um, because this was a landmark paper. Um, this was published in the Lancet uh, Journal in 2005, and this changed the way metastatic spinal cord compression patients are managed. You know, as I mentioned, prior to 2005, these patients had uh, radiotherapy and steroids, and they did not really do very well at all. But the Roy Patchell paper, and Roy Patchell is a neurologist in Kentucky, um, and, and this showed that it was a randomized controlled trial. There were around 50 patients in each group. They looked at surgery plus radiotherapy versus radiotherapy and steroids, which was the standard treatment at the time. If you looked at the ability to walk after treatment, the group who had surgery, around 84 of them retained the ability to walk. And they, if you read the nuances of the paper, the ability to walk means they could take two steps um, with or without a walking aid. And, and so I mean, that's not great walking, but it makes a great difference to a patient who's got significant uh, comorbidities, is facing potentially the, the last uh, phase of their life, if they can stand for transfer, take a couple of steps and, and retain continence. So there was a significant difference, but what really highlighted it was the, the walking longevity. Uh, if you looked at patients who had surgery, they walked for an average of 122 days after their treatment had been completed. The patients who had standard treatment walked for 13 days. That, that's a huge difference, you know, especially, as I say, the patients facing the last phase of their life. And what happens if the patients can't walk? Of course, they, they, they're bedridden. They're then more at risk of developing life-threatening complications. So the pulmonary emboli uh, or DVTPs urinary tract infections, chest infections, pressure ulcers, and all of these lead to earlier demise. Of the patients who came in not able to walk, 62% returned to walking who had surgery versus 19% who did not have surgery. And then the corticosteroid and opioid use in the patients who had surgery was significantly reduced. So this paper, the Roy Patchell paper, is the one to know. This is the landmark paper. The study was stopped early because there was such a significant clinical difference and radiotherapy and steroids alone pretty much uh, disappeared uh, in patients who could qualify for surgical intervention. The other aspect when you go into an exam scenario is you need to have a few items in your toolbox that you can use and as with most classification systems and scoring systems, it can be argued that they're not always that clinically useful. Are they, are, are they practical? Do they actually get used in practice? And probably most of them, the answer will be no, but you do need to just have some of these items in your toolbox that you can uh, augment your answers with. And so the Takuhashi score is a prognostic scoring system for spinal metastases. And it looks at the general condition of the patient, so they pay their, their performance status. It looks at the number of extra spinal mets, the number of mets within the vertebral body, mets to the major internal organs, the primary site of cancer, and the patient's neurological function. And in this case, the higher the score, the better you're expected to do. So the, the, to the total score here, a total score of up to eight, 
prognosis is estimated at less than six months. Score of nine to 11, your prognosis is estimated between six and 12 months. And a score of 12 to 15, your prognosis is estimated at a year or more. In practice, usually when these referrals come through, you speak with the uh, oncologist and you take their view. And of course, oncologists are notoriously optimistic about patients, but it's usually more of a clinical discussion consultant to consultant discussion than putting them formally on a Takuhashi scoring system. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, is especially the, the, the options of oncological management continue to expand. And so oncologists will say to you, well, they, they're on their, they've had their first line, but they still, we've got second line, third line, fourth line. And so it's always, it's very difficult to accurately predict the prognosis when there are potential options of management. And, you know, so that's why it's important to have this as a clinical discussion. And sometimes patients need a clinical review and an anesthetic review before you can take the final decision as to whether they are an appropriate surgical candidate. The next scoring system you need to have a working knowledge of is the spinal instability neoplastic score, so the SIN score. So this, is a, this is, tries to identify or determine the tumor-related spinal instability. And this looks at the location um, of, the, uh, of the lesion. It looks at whether patients have dynamic uh, instability, so mechanical pain. It looks at whether the bone lesion is lytic, mixed or blastic. It looks at the alignment, so acute changes in alignment, essentially whether the patient developed a deformity due to a fracture, so a collapse of the bone. Uh, it looks at if there is collapse, how much collapse has there been, and then whether the posterior aspects of the spine uh, are involved, so whether the posterior column is also compromised. And in this instance, the total score, the higher the score, uh, the worse uh, it is. So higher scores, predict instability and they you know the SIN score of seven or more you should consider surgical intervention. The Asia chart um, so all patients with neurological compromise or threatened neurological compromise should be formally documented on an Asia chart and this is within the spinal units this is usually done as standard it's sometimes the physiotherapists are excellent at doing this and other times you you know it's a, it's a medical um, uh, examination but whoever does it patients need to be documented on an Asia chart prior so on admission usually and then at any point where you think that there may be a delay to 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 surgery or to definitive treatment and then following surgery, they should also be documented from the Asia chart because you want to understand whether your intervention has at, at, at worst not, um, not been detrimental to the patient and hopefully there'll be either uh, plateauing or an improvement in patient symptoms. So back to the NICE guidelines, what are the key priorities for implementation? Well, um, it's really the service configuration and the urgency of treatment. So that, that's why it is, it is a multidisciplinary approach and rapid access into networks. And, and so every oncology unit will have a good working relationship with their, their uh, spinal surgery network and, and refer these patients in. And the next aspect is early detection. So these patients who present with symptoms and the oncologists are usually very good at Patients now get a lot of information through their oncologists. And so we, we are seeing a better uh, information reaching patients and then presenting earlier to the oncologist, but that's not always the case. The ideal is for early access back to their oncologists, rapid evaluation, and then appropriate referral if needed. Imaging, so these patients should all have whole spine MRI scans. Um, interestingly, most oncology units just because of the demands on the MRI scanner they'll probably only do um, they'll do a sagittal T2 image probably do a sagittal T1 weighted image and they may do a stir image as well but they don't always give you they don't they very rarely give you axials unless they spot something in the scanner so there a lot of patients who present with potential um, lesions within the in the spine and where there's a concern regarding MSCC will have essentially what is a, uh, a, 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 a 
sort of whole spine scan, which uh, is, is a sagittal image and, and not a complete scan, but that, that's fine. If that's the, the local um, decision, that's okay. The treatment of spinal metastases is an MSCC. Um, and this we'll, we'll look on, but it, it, we'll look into shortly, but this is really the rapid access, rapid access within the spinal surgery networks. And then following their surgeries, patients need to have supportive care and rehabilitation. So whether that is rehabilitation through a spinal cord injuries center, if they have a persistent neurological deficit, whether it's returned back to the oncologist for the ongoing um, oncological management, it's potentially radiotherapy, chemotherapy, um, or social care. So treatment of um, MSCC, if you look at the pain aspect, so these patients, you first need to manage their pain. And that's analgesia, which can either just be simple analgesia according to an analgesia ladder. Sometimes there needs to be some pain management. Bisphosphonates can be very useful in patients who have myeloma or breast cancer. Um, only use it in prostate cancer if regular analgesia fails. And this is to both reduce the pain and to decrease the risk of fracture. Um, radiotherapy is, can be very effective for non-mechanical pain, but radiotherapy should not be given if patients are asymptomatic. And this, be, this is due to the fact that radiotherapy will essentially kill the bone and kill the surrounding tissue, and it, uh, it potentially then limits your options of ser future surgical uh, intervention. What about vertebroplasty? So vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, which you probably are familiar with, but that's essentially injecting uh, cement into the uh, vertebral body to provide stability. And so if mechanical pain uh, is, is a problem due to vertebral body uh, metastatic disease, uh, then, then uh, vertebroplasty can be very useful um, if, if it, their patients are resistant to analgesia or if they've had a fracture. And then, of course, we get on to surgery, which aims to stabilize the spine. So if the patients are suitable for surgery, you can stabilize the spine, and that should reduce their overall pain. If the spinal cord is threatened, they should be nursed in bed with spinal precautions until you have a definitive plan. Corticosteroids should be started. So who should receive them? Well, all patients should receive dexamethasone, usually a 16 milligram loading dose and then 16 milligrams daily. And that is continued until there is a definitive treatment, uh, either decision or, or the treatment has taken place. So if the patient's having radiotherapy, you continue with the dexamethasone because they're going to still have some swelling around and within the spinal cord. Um, if they have surgery, once you've appropriately decompress the spine, you can consider then stopping or at least uh, weaning the dexamethasone. And the treatment decision is really made on whether the spine is then stable, potentially unstable or unstable. Um, and this is, you, we often have, most units will have a pro forma which you complete and what they really, the treating team want to know in the referring hospital is, is the spine stable? Is it potentially unstable or is it unstable? And if it's stable, they can mobilize the patient. If it's potentially unstable, what are you going to do to make it stable? Is, is that a brace when the patients are mobilizing so that they can normally put it on when they're in a sitting position and they can mobilize or is it unstable? And if it's unstable, generally you have to stabilize it surgically. But if the patients are too unwell to have surgery, then they might have to wear a brace or you can look at a halo um, uh, uh, a jacket or a CTLSO, something like that. Uh, so a brace to stabilize the spine. Surgery for MSCT. So if a patient is referred and they have proven spinal, metastatic spinal cord compression on an MRI scan, they should be considered for surgery. The only exceptions are really if they, as, as we discussed with the, uh, the, the factors that if their general performance status is poor, if their physiology is that poor that the oncologists say, well, they, their, their prognosis is expected to be less than three months, um, or if they've got associated 
uh, medical comorbidities where the anaesthetist says, no way is this patient fit for an anaesthetic. If you decide to perform surgery, it should be within 24 hours. You should take samples for histology. Most of them will have his proven histology, but it's always good practice to take appropriate samples for histology. They should have <clears throat> staging done. Now, normally that will be done by the oncology team. So that's chest, abdo, pelvis, CT. Uh, some of them will have they would have had PET scans, they would have had appropriate MRI scans, they would have had their blood investigations, um, they would have had all the appropriate staging investigations, but it's about liaising with the oncologist to ensure that that, that that has taken place. And then it's a formal assessment. These patients, usually it's best to get them across and for them to be evaluated formally in the unit where they can have their surgery. It is a balance because you don't want to have a wasted journey. You don't want to bring a patient across who is never going to be fit for an operation, but sometimes you can only take that decision having met the patient and giving the patient the opportunity with the appropriate information to make a decision as to whether they believe surgery is the right option for them. And it's a combined decision. It, it, as, as we mentioned, it, it's a multidisciplinary approach, but always at the center of that decision is the patient because these are difficult, difficult decisions and they come at very stressful times for the patient and for the family, and especially at the moment with the COVID restrictions. It's, a, it, it, it's horrendous for these patients to be in the situation where they don't have supporting family uh, accompanying them. It's, it's a really difficult time, but the patient has to always be at the center of making the decision. Um, and some patients will rightly say, well, you know, I." I've, I've had enough, I don't want surgery. And if, if they you know, have capacity and they know what, they, uh, what they're what choosing with all the information, that, that's fine. But they, they should have the opportunity to make that decision. Um, and then when you assess them, you're looking at their neurological function, their general function, their general health, what treatment they've previously had, clearly if they've previously had radiotherapy to the same area, that comes into play. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't operate on them, but you know that they're going to be wound problems because the, the surrounding zone of tissue is dead. Um, the, the magnitudes of surgery. So these patients need to understand the scale of surgery. You know, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively straightforward procedure, but other times it's not. If you're doing an anterior and posterior approach, the magnitude of surgery and the morbidity that comes with it and the, the increased length of hospital stay potentially is something that needs to be considered carefully. The risks associated with surgery. Um, uh, and then the prognosis. And, and as, as I've mentioned, surgery should only be offered to patients when the expectation is that they will survive for more than three months. What about the goals of surgery? Well, the goals of surgery are to decompress the spinal cord or cord requiner and provide stability. If there is complete loss of neurological function for more than 24 hours, you should only offer surgery if the stabilization is needed for pain relief. But I would say that this isn't set in stone. You know, I think if there is an opportunity to operate on a patient and it's 30 hours down the line, you know, I, th I think you should consider that strongly. You know, I, I, I wouldn't stick to this rigorously. You want to achieve a wide decompression and debulking of the tumor. You're not going for an on block resection. Um, you want to achieve stabilization. And if there is anterior involvement, you want to inform, reinforce the vertebral body. And that may be uh, by putting some cement, some PMMA cement in the front. Uh, it may be by using a cage or really a bone graft, but um, it's usually PMMA cement or a cage. Uh, there was one uh, question about the role of solumid role uh, nowadays. It's uh, a steroid called methylprednisolone. So are you using it routinely for spinal cord compression, metastatic spinal cord compression, or you're relying to other steroids or none? So as far as I know, we are only using dexamethasone. I've not seen them come through on, on different steroids. On different that, that, steroids. that decision is usually made. Um, the oncologists are pretty good at this. I mean, they, they often start patients on steroids before 
uh, before they've even got the MRI. You know, if they've got a patient who's got known spinal met, comes in with deteriorating neurology, they'll start the patient on, on steroids. And as far as I've, I've only seen them use dexamethasone yeah. um, and, and then scan the patient and then refer the patient on. Um, so that decision is usually made at the referring institution. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, and uh, what is the criteria to diagnose a threatened spinal cord? So, so threatened spinal cord is someone who has uh, pain, uh, so, so known spinal metastases, and yeah. there is canal compromise on an MRI scan. So, uh, but neurological function is still intact. So that's what I'm. What what is meant by a threatened spinal cord? So the spinal cord is actually being compressed. So there is canal compression due to metastatic lesion, but the neurological function is still intact. And and and, and these are the best patients to to act quickly on because if you get it right, these patients will retain their neurological function. Um, and so that that's what's meant by a threatened spinal cord. Yes, and uh, for the oncologist workout uh, workup, do you uh, prefer your own institute um, institute oncologist, or you can accept the referral the referring uh, hospitals oncologist if they have one? Oh, we we accept uh, any oncologist referral. So, I, th I think the you know the, the workup we we really for. MSCC management, so this is not primary bone tumors that, that we're discussing. So for MSCC, we really are, are supporting the oncologists in their management of, of these patients. You know, so, so our service is, is, is really there to provide support when it is needed because they're seeing thousands of these patients and, and a, a number of them will, will end up needing our support, but we really, uh, support them and, and, and are happy for them to take the lead in the overall management. And then it's a it's a consultant to consultant dis, uh, discussion usually as to whether the patient is appropriate. Um, we also do you know when pay, when referrals come through, they are discussed in a multidisciplinary team meeting. So at the RNH, for instance, we would discuss these patients every day. We have an uh, an MDT. And so these patients would be discussed in the MDT. And then it's usually, you know, a lot of patients would be able, we would acknowledge that they have metastatic disease, but they don't have significant canal compromise. The spinal cord or cord requirement is not being compressed. It's more a decision on, on the spinal stability. And then we feed that back to them. Uh, but but it's, it's sometimes, you know, the, the almost always, I should I say, is that the best decision is made when, You've, you've come up with a recommendation and you get on the phone and you speak to the oncologist directly. Yeah, uh, totally agree, sir. Uh, and for, well, there's three questions, mostly with the same meaning. So first is, uh, is trauma the same as uh, uh, metastatic spinal cord compression? Do you use dexamethasone is in trauma and is there any guidelines in using dexamethasone in trauma as well as the uh, the uh, metastatic spinal cord compression so in the in the uk practice we do not use any steroids in trauma uh, yeah. so there's no no good evidence to use steroids in trauma in in us practice they that probably differs and my understanding is that they do use steroids but in UK practice we do not use steroids in trauma in spinal cord injuries. Yeah thank you and uh, when consenting for potential complications what are you highlighting and the frequency they occur? Okay so the firstly the main benefit of surgery to highlight to the patients is to try and preserve what they currently have. Yeah. And they need to understand that it's not, they mustn't make the decision on surgery because of potential improvement in their neurological function. The primary goal is to retain what they have. The secondary goal is to give the spinal cord the best chance of recovery if there is going to be any recovery. 
And the third goal is to provide stability. And so when I look at what are the risks then, so the number one risk will be ongoing neurological deficit. There could be a deterioration of their neurological function, which could be either due to the uh, to an injury at the time of the surgery or due to an evolving spinal cord injury. Um, and then the other, the other risks are the same as for any spinal surgical procedure. So it will be general risks such as uh, infection, blood clots, you know, the blood clots, especially if they're not going to be mobilizing, this infection, blood clots, um, uh, bleeding. And so some of these tumors can bleed quite a lot. So I always say bleeding, potentially life-threatening bleeding. Specifically with this surgery, it's nerve injury, spinal cord injury, um, non-union, failure of uh, metal work. So screws can cut out, rods can break especially if they're going to have radiotherapy where this is unlikely to ever unite. Um, so non-union is, is a big risk. Um, wound breakdown, uh, especially in, in the presence of a site which has had radiotherapy or potentially will have radiotherapy quite soon after. And then the other risks are dural injury because you're doing a decompression. So you're working against the dura, so dural injury, recurrence of tumor, as anesthetic related risks and the risk to life. And I think that that encompasses most of the risks that I would discuss with patients having this operation. What I also discuss with them is the implication of surgery. What impact will it have on them? I say, so most patients, if they come to us walking, the expectation is that within five days, they will leave hospital back to their referring unit. If they come to us bed bound, that's probably a bit more complicated because that recovery is going to be a bit longer. When you have a good working relationship with the oncology unit, though, the, the, the ideal situation is it's a fix and send. So they come to you, they have their surgery, and as soon as the acute uh, risks dissipate, you send them back for them to have their ongoing systemic management because then your job is done. Yeah, you totally agree. And uh, if there is established paralysis over 24 hours and there is no instability but the life expectancy is over four months will you still do any surgery for it so they they completely paralyzed yes no instability More than 24 hours no yeah. st instability and long life expectancy well, would you still decompress um no. It's a difficult one. I think these, these decisions are, are, are individualized, you know, and this, this is where you have the discussion with the oncologist and, and sometimes where it warrants um, you know, a face to face discussion with the patient because um, it depends on, you know, as I said, oncologists are notoriously optimistic with their life expectancy. And if, yeah. if it's genuinely a patient who's, who's on first line therapy, or maybe it's a, it's a first time, it's, it's an initial diagnosis, we don't have a histological diagnosis. Those are factors that come into play. And then, then you could take the view that doing an operation to decompress the spine, you know, if, if it's 26 hours, that's probably different from if it's two weeks, the patient's been, uh, been completely paralyzed for two weeks. So that comes into play. You can get good samples, you can stabilize the spine. Is it an uh, an isolated metastatic lesion or there multiple metastatic lesions you know what's the overall burden of disease for the patient so all these factors come into play but often that sort of scenario um i i, I, I always think you try and give the patient the benefit of the doubt and, and if there is a chance of making a bit of difference to the patient because the, the truth is that not all patients will present, it's not a black and white scenario, you know, some patients will present with some retention of function, continence is another big aspect, you know, so they may be paralyzed, but if, they, if they've got even just bladder continence, it makes a huge difference to these patients to try and retain continence. Thank you. And would you recommend embolization for... Uh, operation to METS of renal cell carcinoma? That's a very, very good question. Um, so if you look at the evidence, um, the only tumour that uh, strongly advised to use embolization is renal cell carcinoma. And, and, and so almost always, um, 
we would aim to embolize a patient who has known renal cell carcinoma. Um, and, and when you look at the evidence, it probably makes about a 50% difference in terms of the blood loss and the need for transfusion. But I was looking at some of the evidence recently, and I must say, it's not conclusive. It's not conclusive, but in, in, in UK practice, we probably do embolize, if not all, then almost all patients with renal cell carcinoma. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's all. Uh, you either answer directly or indirectly by uh, answering the, <laughs> the okay. questions. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed that lecture. Um, it brings back some memories of me vivering Joe, I think. Yes. The classification <laughs> systems. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Takayashi score. Takayashi. Yeah. <laughs> we did, didn't we? Um, <laughs> So, and, and I think it was really important the way that you kind of, um, you know, emphasize the MDT role and the importance of, you know, involving the patient and their family in their, in their treatment, you know, because um, that's a really lovely way of dealing with it. And, you know, I'd suggest to the people that are listening, that's the kind of approach and the kind of manner that you want to have when you get asked a question like this. Um, in your vivas so if you weren't paying attention to that side of it watch it again because I think that's really important um, so Ruth tells me that we are going to do the MCQs next um, and then we'll move on to some cases just uh, disc case discussion sorry first and then we'll move on to vivas so if you can all answer as quickly as you can it's all anonymous um, and then we can carry on with the um, interesting cases. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the majority of people managed to uh, to complete this. Um, right, so question number one, Roy Patchell's paper was a randomized controlled trial. Choose the incorrect statement. This is just to emphasize again, Roy Patchell's paper, you know, if, you, if that's, uh, uh, you know, do take that away from tonight, uh, because that's, if you men mention that, you're getting up onto your um, seven uh, during your FRCS. So, number one, it compared uh, standard radiotherapy and steroid versus surgery plus radiotherapy. Yes, that's right. Um, it was stopped early due to clear superiority in the group having surgery. Yes, that's right. Patients treated with surgery retained walking ability for a median 122 days. Yes, that's right. That was compared to 13 days in the group who had the standard radiotherapy plus steroids. The surgery group required higher doses of opioid analgesia. Uh, no, uh, they didn't. So that, that's the incorrect statement. Um, so the surgery group did not require higher doses of either opioid analgesia or steroids. And finally, there was, there, there was no excess mortality or morbid morbidity due to surgery. That's uh, correct, actually. The surgery, interestingly, the patients did not spend longer in hospital and they had no excess mortality or morbidity reported. Um, question number two, which type of surgery is not appropriate for MSCC due to a vertebral body tumour? Post-year decompression stabilisation with screws and rods, that's almost always what you would do. Uh, Posterior decompression without stabilisation, that is the correct answer because in the question it says uh, a metastatic lesion in the vertebral body. So when the vertebral body is involved anteriorly, um, I don't know if you can see my spine model, but you know, if the vertebral body is involved, so if you imagine that there's a compromise to the structure anteriorly, and you then go and do a posterior decompression at the back, you normally have to do a relatively wide decompression, so you take away the facet joint, so you've now disrupted the posterior column, and you've then compromised the stability of the spine, which is why you should not generally you should not do that without stabilization um, and the other answers are, are correct a posterior decompression and stabilization with screws and rods plus vertebral body augmentation with pmma cement that would be very reasonable to do two-stage decompression instrumented stabilization it can be an appropriate approach as well um, so the majority of, of uh, 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 the delegates um, who responded got that correct. So 
Question number three, patients who have MSCC due to the following tumour should not have steroids. And again, the majority of, of, uh, the, can, uh, of the delegates responding got that, um, got that right. So even in lymphoma, uh, if there is uh, MSCC, so metastatic spinal cord compression, uh, they should have uh, steroids. So well done there, everyone. Good, so case number one. 78-year-old um, male patient, he presents to his oncology team with a two-week history of deteriorating walking. He uses two sticks. He has known prostate uh, cancer. His, his between first and second line treatment is not the most reliable patient, but um, I believe his initial diagnosis was about two to three years uh, before this presentation. So he's referred with the MRI scans that we can see. Uh, so there's a sagittal and an axial T2 image. Um, this is of the thoracic spine and the top of the lumbar spine. What you can see is uh, he's got um, multiple vertebrae that have some infiltration, but the main focus of the problem is in the thoracic spine, he has a significant canal infiltration of the tumor and the spinal cord is significantly compromised. So you can see the spinal cord above and below the tumor and you can see cerebrospinal fluid above and below. Now, when you look at it on axial view, uh, you can see the spinal cord is completely surrounded by tumour which has extended into the canal. And the tumour you can see is, uh, has eroded through the posterior wall of the vertebral body into the canal. So one of the aspects I wanted to highlight to you is uh, uh, when I trained the, one of the radiologists in Leeds, he always talked about good discs or bad news and bad discs are good news. And so what does that mean? Well, if the disc is preserved, as you see here, um, if it really is cancer, uh, sorry, if the disc is preserved, it, 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 it most commonly is cancer. It really is infection. If the discs are destroyed, it most commonly is infection and really is cancer. The only real, um, uh, um, uh, the, the only condition that doesn't fit into that is tuberculosis because tuberculosis uh, will preserve the discs but uh, uh, but you know it, it, it's an infection and what does that mean so if it's good discs are bad news so if the discs look good it's bad news because it's likely to be cancer if the discs are bad so bad discs are good news because it's likely to be infection and likely to get better so this has all the features of, of a, an aggressive lesion. Um, and so this is all, all features of aggression in a patient with known prostate cancer. This is almost certainly a metastatic lesion and he has metastatic spinal cord compression. So this patient we got across, I saw him. He was actually not surprisingly, you often are surprised in these, he was walking quite well uh, using his two sticks, he was continent, and so he was a good surgical candidate. And this is the operation that I did for him. Uh, so this is a view under the microscope, um, that's uh, superior end, that's the inferior end. So this is the canal has been cleared out now, the, you can see the dura coming through, and I've done it, not, an, not a very wide decompression, but that's a reasonable decompression. The cord actually looked quite nice and healthy. It was pulsating um, and just additional stability. So one level up, one level down, because I did not destroy the facet joints. And, and he, did, he did really well. He was discharged back to the oncologist three days later. He retained the ability to walk. He retained his continence and he uh, went on to have radiotherapy. Any questions on case number one? Okay, I'll move on to case number two, and then I think uh, it. Uh, you, you probably I, I think there is uh, um, a question. 
Okay. Uh, did you have a CT scan to plan surgery beforehand? That's a very good question, actually. Um, in this case, uh, we did have a CT scan, and that, that, that raises a very good point. So ideally, you should have a CT scan. It's not always the case, though, but ideally, you should have a CT scan. And often these patients have had CT scans not too long ago because it's part of their uh, surveillance uh, okay. imaging. Yeah. And in prostate cancer, this so this is a uh, this this is a sclerotic lesion. It's a blastic lesion, and so it's um, it there wasn't a big concern for stability, and that's the other reason why you can get away with short fixation. So you can just do one level up, one level down, mm -hmm. uh, because if you revert back to your uh, your your sins, um, scoring this would be you know this is a this this is a plastic lesion it's it wouldn't be it won't be very unstable it's a, it's a pretty stable lesion um, but in this case we did have a recent ct scan you mostly do but not always but if you do need it for surgical planning then by all means uh, obtain it thank you and um you did only a posterior decompression i presume that it is because it's an, a sclerotic lesion more than osteo uh, lytic lesion, is that? Yeah, and, and he was going to have radiotherapy and they, they thought that this would be quite radiosensitive. So um, I did go reasonably wide around the, uh, the into the lateral recesses, um, but it, it's always a balance, you know, in a patient who has, um, who has quite good neurologi neurological function, there's always a risk in, in, in doing more. You know, it's a, it's a balance. You want to achieve a decent decompression, but, you know, going around the spinal cord at this level, you have to go quite wide because you can't, you know, it's not like cord recliner level where you can retract um, the dura. So at the cord level, you have to go around. You've got to be very careful around the cord. And so it's a balance, you know, to, to have gotten anterior to it from the posterior side, I would have had to take the facet joints, gone quite wide, to access the vertebral body. And that, that would be a, that's a very reasonable approach. And if someone had evolving neurological function or they has, have lost their neurological function, I'd probably be more aggressive with my decompression. But in this case, I only did posterior. Thank you. And do you have, do you decide when to start the radiotherapy or is it the oncologist? It, that's usually a combined decision. Um, normally you want the wound to be healed. And, and so, it's it's typically minimum of three, you know, probably six weeks if possible, um, but but it depends on the burden of disease and how, you know that's normally a discussion. But ideally, you want the wound to be healed because if they give radiotherapy to a wound which has not healed and it breaks down, it, it, it's a disaster. Then it's never going to heal, and you're looking at plastic surgery flaps, um, which you sometimes have to get, but it's 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 just never a good result the, the this case is inviting more and more questions actually <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and is there any criteria for surgery for versus radiotherapy Sorry, criteria for surgery versus radiotherapy. versus radiotherapy i think this is decision making and whether or not there is any compression is that correct then? yeah well he had so if you look at i mean so he is losing neurological function. His walking had been deteriorating over a period of about two weeks. Um, he's definitely got significant disease within the central canal. And so I, if you look at Roy Patchell's paper, which admittedly is not a huge series, you know, and there's not, there's not a great deal to, to support that or to dispute it, but that's the best evidence we have. Um, you know, if you only do radiotherapy to this patient, almost certainly his outcome will be worse. Yeah. And so adding surgery in is, is definitely the right uh, option here. And did you take a biopsy during yes, the- Yes, I, uh, I mean, I always send biopsies. Uh, biopsies okay. from, so it, 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 it's more than a biopsy usually, you know, you get you get a lot of tumor, you just, yeah. you just fill the Standard container way. with tumor and send yeah. it away, yes. Yeah, and 
is that the open door laminoplasty? I don't think so. Is it? No, no. This is this no, is just this is, a, this is just this is a laminectomy. So a laminectomy, yeah. A taking laminectomy. off the, the back of the spine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's okay. all the questions I think. Yeah. So the last case I'm going to uh, run through is um, uh, so case number two, 63 year old male patient. So this is a slightly different scenario. So he's bed bound. Uh, his left leg at grade zero motor power, his right leg at grade one motor power. He was still continent, um, although he had been catheterized just because of his, his, his mobility, but he did have bladder sensation. And this is prostate uh, CA. So he's, he'd been bed bound for about um, 48 hours by the time he came to see me. Um, and, and so we took the the view that he's a 63 year old male, the oncologist felt he, he still had, uh, his prognosis was pretty good. He had a few lines of treatment left and mainly because of the continence, um, I decided to, to operate on him. And you can see on the axial view, so on the, on the sagittal view, that's significant degenerative change in his cervical spine, but the spinal cord is, is, is okay. and, and, and um, the main area is here. This, this is a metastatic lesion in the thoracic spine with significant uh, encroachment into the canal. And if you look at it, so it doesn't look too bad on, on the sagittal. It looks like there is CSF there. But if you look at it on the, on the axial, you, know, you can see again, it comes in like this curtain sign almost. It sort of comes in surrounding the spinal cord and the spinal cord is is significantly threatened here. He, well, it's not only threatened, he has lost neurological function. And so I proceeded to operate. And on this occasion, the surgery was a bit more extensive because he had lost neurological function. And the aim here was to do a wide decompression. So what you can see is uh, that's superior, that's inferior. Um, so a wide laminectomy, the spinal cord is under the dura here, these are the nerve roots coming out. So the facet joints have been taken and I went in anterior to the spinal cord in this zone, um, compressed it down, got as much tumor as possible um, and, and, and then uh, achieved the anterior decompression and went three levels up, three levels down to provide stability. Um, he did not improve, but he retained his continence. And, and so, yeah, that's, I think that's what you often have to accept in these patients. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Michael. I hope that was, um, hope you guys find that really useful because um, that's the kind of stuff you will get in the exams. Um, so I think that we are going to move on to the vivas now. So I will stop recording.